There are probably four words that um, trigger warning bells for me unlike anything else. Um, and those four words are, let's make this fun. Uh, or, it will be fun. Uh, <laughs> and it might, be, it might be the introvert in me. Does anyone read the Oatmeal comics, by the way? Um, so if you don't, check out Oatmeal. Uh, is it oatmeal.com? .net, oatmeal. Um, he's recently done one on, um, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, he's actually he labelled this thing called uh, JOMO, the joy of missing out, where you actually just stay at home with a cup of tea, and it's quite lovely. This sounds possibly a little bit uh, funny, given that we're talking about the topic of fun. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense of my background, and then we're going to go just put a little bit of a sceptical lens on this fun thing, because... There is a horrid buzzword out there at the moment called gamification, which makes all of these cheap, quick promises. Uh, there's a few great examples of it, but there's a lot of pitfalls. So I'm going to navigate us through that a little bit. Then we'll look at some of the, some of the perspectives we need to bring if we actually want to design uh, opportunities in which fun and play are more likely to manifest. Damn it. We, um, my, uh, Kim gave me a challenge to not mention the word play in this talk. And there you go. <laughs> Fail. Um, I, um, so I studied uh, motivation science as my PhD, um, and so there was a time in which I thought I was at the forefront of motivation science. I was lecturing at schools, uh, lecturing at three universities, um, speaking in schools and so on, uh, and doing the classic stuff like, um, has anyone here endured a presentation on smart goal setting before? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> positive affirmations, all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but then I started to play World of Warcraft, um, <laughs> which, uh, you know, despite having health goals, finance goals, thesis writing goals, uh, I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft. Um, it was actually at the point where at the university, um, it was a little bit sad, maybe. Um, people thought that I was working really hard and, oh, you stay back so late. And like, I know, I know. And I'd go into my office and I'd close the blinds and I'd log into Azeroth, in which I was a level 40 Blood Elf rogue. Um, so for the couple of people in the room who maybe haven't played World of Warcraft, um, uh, that's like the redhead, redheaded elves. Um, so I was this really pale um, redheaded elf uh, and my job was to make potions for my guild. I was the guild alchemist. Um, so people would go on raids, they'd collect really ob you know, great items. I'd make potions for people, health potions, mana potions, stamina potions, potions of invisibility, potions of speed, potions of stamina, potions of endurability, potions of invulnerability. You know, I was pretty much breaking bad in this game. You know? <laughs> I, I, I was the one who knocked, you know? Um, and I got a lot of respect. Um, a lot of respect um, from... Uh, only 13 year old boys and sad old men, but you know. Um, but it got to the point where three months had gone by and the progress on all the other goals that I had had kind of stopped because I was much more motivated to make potions for my guild and to progress my character and to, you know, I was looking forward to finally getting um, my mount, my first mount, that could sound dodgy, just, you know, hear me out. It's where your character finally gets to, in my instance, as a blood elf, gets to ride a bird. And so it's like riding an emu or an ostrich and increases your movement speed by 40%. I know I lived for that moment. I couldn't wait to get that bird because uh, it means that if you hold down the down, you know, the forward arrow, it just moves slightly faster. It, as it turns out, it was a little bit anticlimactic. Um, but as, at the same time, I reached that level, I was moving house, and I lost my internet connection for a while. And that got me really curious. I thought, oh, hang on, what's going on here? Somehow this game has displaced all the motivation for me to pursue other more meaningful and more relevant goals. I got really curious about what was going on there. And um, so I started to explore that. Uh, at the time, I shared this with um, the uh, academics at uh, the university I was with, and they just harumphed and they said, oh, and people only play games to avoid work. It's an escapist form of entertainment, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so does anyone here play golf? Good, no, neither do I. Oh, there you go, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, my mini golf, maybe. The sun, <laughs> the sun is my arch nemesis. Um, so, you know, whatever, I just... But it's interesting, you look at the game of golf, right? Uh, if the goal is to get the ball in the hole and the least number of shots, one could simply take the ball and walk, you know, kind of near, near to the hole, put it right next to the hole, take the shot from there, and your efficiency would go through the roof. Your return on effort would be astronomical. It'd be amazing, and if you, you know, you could get really clever with this, and 
Uh, maybe drill a hole in your desk and just put the ball in the hole every time you wanted to win the game of golf. Um, you could have multiple tubes set up with balls running through holes and you'd be winning multiple games of golf even while you sleep. Except <laughs> games don't work like that. They have rules to make it difficult. People don't play games to avoid work. They play games to engage in well-designed work. And this is really interesting. How do we design work to have this kind of inherently motivating experience? Um, uh, there's this, oh, we heard about sport, basketball and stuff like that. And, you know, I've read a lot about sport. Um, it's really interesting. You look at what happens with sport. People are motivated to move these objects through posts or through rings uh, in order to get a sense of progress in the form of points. And they're happy to invest. If you look at someone playing Scrabble, it doesn't look like they're having fun necessarily. They look half constipated through most of the time. It's like they've, they've got this um, really tricky set of letters and they're, they're thinking, oh crap, what do I do with this? And then finally they put down their two letter word and then they're impatient because the other person's taking too much time and they've got this perfect score lined up with that triple word and then the next person takes that thing and it's all, it's essentially frustration. Uh, Well-designed frustration is what a game is. And there are so many nuances to how we actually design an experience that is inherently motivating. How we design an experience where people want to persist through this challenging work? How do we design an experience that uh, allows people to uh, engage in this challenge in a way that de develops mastery, gives them a sense of progress, all these wonderful things. And yet, what happens is I'll have um, people come up to me, uh, so a lot of my work is with large and multinational organizations, and someone will come up to me and they'll say, we want to make this fun. And what they have in mind is usually a cheap sprinkling of points, badges, leaderboards, some cheap hacks that they'll, you know, sugarcoat on top of an otherwise really crappy experience in an attempt to make it fun. And this, this kind of annoys me. So, um, has anyone been in an experience where, um, oh, maybe it's coming up, where someone, you know, in your family, Christmas is coming up and they're saying, it will be fun. Uh, but there's almost like this hidden emphasis on it will be fun. You <laughs> will have a good time. And someone has put a lot of effort into curating this idealistic experience in their mind where everyone's going to come along and we're all going to have a good time with the G and the T capitalized. Um, and, and sometimes it doesn't really work out like that because there's complexities to take on board and making things fun or making people have a playful experience is a lot more complicated or complex than that. There's also, there's, when I come back to gamification, at the time that I wrote my book, The Game Changer, um, uh, a beautiful presentation by Jane McGonigal came out on TED. If you haven't looked up Jane McGonigal, um, check her out. Uh, Jane McGonigal has done a TED presentation on why gaming can make a better world. She wrote a book called Reality is Broken. She's since done another two TED talks. It's brilliant. Uh, she can't stand, stand the term gamification. Uh, she can't stand the term gamification, will not stand by it. Uh, Daniel Pink, uh, the author of Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, a wonderful motivation scientist, uh, also is incredibly skeptical about gamification. In fact, what happens is a lot of the people that design games got really, really pissed off and kind of alienated from those that were really frothy about gamification, primarily because the focus was on two different areas. Game design is about how do we design challenges and experiences that are inherently motivating. And a lot of what we've seen in gamification to date has been about how can we extrinsically motivate people in order to do particular things. There is a book, and I kid you not, there is a book out there and it has someone, mm, someone on like a, the cover has someone uh, on a factory line and the, uh, the title is, how to exploit your workers while keeping them happy. And we got a hint of this when Barney was sharing his presentation beforehand, the free, the freemium, um, the free, free to play software where you buy a game, it's free to play. You'll then enter these experiences where uh, it's actually more psychologically powerful for people to avoid loss than to have gain. So what will happen is the game experience, if that's this one version of this coercive design, in this game experience, you'll accrue a lot of really special things and you'll be put into a scenario 
where you'll potentially lose all those things unless you have enough gems or insert sort of some sort of currency. The only way you can prevent losing essentially all that hard work and progress up to that point is if you make a transaction. The moment you make that transaction, the difficulty calibrates as a result of you having made that purchase because research suggests once you make a purchase, you're more likely to make more continued purchases. And so what happens is the algorithms shift and you're kind of entering this very, very manipulative experience designed to extract money from you. Now, that's, that's kind of what a lot of the large and multinational organizations want secretly when they're saying, we want to make things fun. Um, so that's, what, uh, that's why I'm not really that excited about that. There is a quote by uh, a philosopher called James Cass. And whoa, there we are. Well, that, that's kind of like a filler slide. I, that's, uh, there's, there's a book um, called Finite and Infinite Games. Um, it's a beautiful philosophical book. It's the type of book I try to read once a year. Uh, he has beautiful quotes like, um, only that which can change can continue. Um, finite players play within boundaries, infinite players play with boundaries. He sees life as this vision of play and possibility in which there are at least two types of games. Uh, one that could be called finite, that happens within boundaries, the other infinite. This kind of parallels a lot of beautiful philosophies. Um, there's a, a Marshall Rosenberg, the um, uh, pioneer in nonviolent communication. He also has a line that says that uh, in life there are two types of games we can play. One is the game of who's right, in which we either make ourselves right or someone else right and make, therefore make someone wrong. He says it's a game in which everyone loses. We're probably familiar with that. The alternative game is the game of making life wonderful. And that's the space, if we're thinking about designing for play, that is where we need to be having our heads at. If we want to create work environments, cultures uh, at work where play is more likely to manifest, we don't make people play. We don't force it upon it. We don't force people to have fun. Instead, we design environments, just like we've heard, in which play is more likely to manifest. Now, what, what are my notes here? I was going to say, um, there, this is important because a lot of people jump to this fun part very early. And it's much more important to start with functional before you go to the fun part. And if there is one thing when it comes to motivation, um, and we're going to dip into motivation a little bit here, but this is the one, the number one tip. If a member asks for one tip about motivation, this is the thing. It all comes down to visibility of progress. The more people can see how their effort contributes to a sense of progress, the more likely they are to, con uh, to continue to contribute effort towards that progress. If as soon as you realize this, and this is the number one breakthrough idea from the Harvard Business Review in 2010, the more people can see how their effort contributes to a meaningful sense of progress, the more likely they are to invest effort in towards that. Which means that if you're designing work, it's much less about achieving some distant fixed goals and much more about how do we celebrate small wins along the way. If you work in an environment in which uh, someone gives you a particular assignment and uh, you know, say, say your boss says to you, um, I need you to get this report on my desk by Monday morning, it's really important, um, you know, and have got some people coming from overseas, uh, really important. And so you, you, you work on this thing and um, you, know, you work really hard, you stay back late, you work on the weekend, Monday morning comes, you email it off, you don't hear anything. Tuesday comes, you still haven't heard anything. Wednesday, you send off an email, hey, just checking you got that report, make sure it's okay. And then later on Wednesday afternoon, you get an email back that says, thanks, turns out I didn't need it. What we learn in that moment is should a similar request come about again in the future, it is much more likely that we're going to default to a conservative level of effort because we just don't know if it's going to go anywhere. And so if you want people to invest more effort into the things that matter, we need to create visibility of progress for them. Uh, what we have in it before or um, teams where there's a high level of communication, communication, those feedback loops are shortened, people can get that sense of progress really, really quickly. But if people are working in fuzziness, if they don't know exactly what the goal or the purpose is, if they don't know what is meaningful in terms of progress, it's likely that they're going to default to a conservative le level of effort. Or they'll switch to things that provide a rich sense of progress, which is why sometimes you'll see people um, 
just doing things like checking email at work because email provides such a rich sense of progress. Uh, sometimes it's more better for people, more better, sometimes it's better for people's careers to be broadcasting the work that they're doing rather than actually doing the work. And so in some organisations you have people that are more inclined just to hit reply all or CC everyone in the postcard for every little decision that they're thinking about making at some point than it is actually getting on with the work. And we'll, we'll see ourselves doing this all the time. Like I have this form, way of, um, I visually, uh, I geometrically arrange things that gives me a nice visible sense of progress. And um, uh, I know that, you know, many people switch to Candy Crush or games that provide a rich and immediate sense of progress. Uh, and when it comes to writing down lists of things to do, many of us will write down things that we've already done just so that we can tick that off and get that sense of progress. We love seeing progress. We know, love knowing that our efforts are contributing to progress. If we want this to be fun, if we want this to be playful, we need to get these core elements of our work sorted out. Otherwise, we'll be working in insecurity. And so here's a couple of quick tips uh, in terms of how do we design work to be playful? How do we actually make work meaningful, make work playful? There's not a lot of notes in my slides. Um, I kind of designed these at about 11 o'clock last night for you. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about uh, empathy so far, and that's definitely a, a, an element in this. Your ability to empathize with your people or the people that you want to have fun or to experience uh, an environment in which fun and play are more likely to manifest is really important. Right now, we seem to be going through this phase where a lot of our friends are getting married. And that means a lot of hens and bucks nights. And these can take various forms of flavors at the moment. And um, I'll tell you the one thing that doesn't necessarily tick my boxes is ones that involves clubbing because my experience of clubbing is that you, you know, spend most of your time lining up in a line surrounded by dickheads and idiots to pay some idiot bouncer money to get into a place that's even more crowded where you instantly lose your friends and you have to line up to get a drink surrounded by idiots to get one an idiot bartender that overcharges you a drink which is going to be jostled out of your hand before you even find your friends. So it's just a, it's a nightmare. I don't understand. How, but there are people out there that find this fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have friends that find it fun to watch, uh, you know, a bunch of people dressed in white, you know, stand around and getting sunburnt all day. Um, cricket. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, that, you know, that ticks their boxes. So we need to think through this. And then if we're going to design it, I'll give you the basic elements of what a game is. And this is whether it's a board game, a sports game, or a video game. And these are the building blocks that we can play with. And then maybe we'll jump into some Q&A around it because um, we can go anywhere with this. So the three elements of any game are essentially goals, rules, and feedback. All games are, are the interplay of goals, rules, and feedback. Whether it's a board game, a sports game, a video game, role-playing game, a training game, any game. Goals, rules, and feedback. A good game is a goal-driven, challenge-intense, and feedback-rich experience geared towards progress. Just because things are a game doesn't mean they're good. Most games are crap, but good games are well-designed. Good games have gone through a lot of playtesting to become good. If we think about this term, goals, rules, feedback, one can understand, you know, we think about Scrabble, we think about any particular game, it kind of makes sense. There's a particular goal, there are rules in play, and there's ways of obtaining feedback. But then if you start to take a little bit more of a philosophical approach and look at the work that you do, you can see a lot of the work that you do could be viewed through this lens of goals, rules, feedback. Any project that you've undertaken could be seen as a game. You have a goal, you have an objective, there are certain rules, you have this much time, this much budget to achieve this, and there's feedback. Are we on track? Are we hitting our KPIs? And so therefore, any game, uh, any project that you've undertaken could be viewed through the lens of game design. If it's poorly designed, if it wasn't inherently motivating, we can get curious, what, what were the factors? Was the goal much too quantified? Did it narrow our focus? Was it too specific and therefore cut off our ability to innovate along the way? Or was it something where it was far too loose and I spent most of my time in anxiety because I didn't know what we were working towards? Were the rules a legacy of a previous um, uh, set of policies or you know, that were no longer relevant in this context? Or were there not enough rules so you actually didn't know what, what you were empowered to focus on? You, didn't actually, you couldn't actually work it out. There wasn't enough structure to it. With the feedback, was the feedback loops tight or was there a lot of latency? Um, does anyone here um, have Jamie Oliver's 30 Minute Meals book? Mm. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, 
I've I recently said to Kim, my uh, wife, that I'm not cooking any more 30 minute meals. Um, the goal when we ever, you know, the game of the 30 minute meals, the goal of um, any time we cook Jamie Ellis 30 minute meals is to cook it in under an hour and 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> The rules are, here's a complex set of steps that are unforgivingly sequenced, um, and the feedback is, does it look anything remotely like the picture? Um, are we emotionally stable? Um, <laughs> that's the game that we play there. And there are many different games that we play, uh, and you can see beautiful examples of what other people might call gamification. There was a project called Fun Theory, in which um, in a particular part of Eastern Europe, they ran this experiment where if you're driving a car and you're driving uh, over the speed limit, your photo would be taken, you'd get sent an infringement notice. But if you're driving and obeying the law, your photo would also get taken and you'd get entered into a pot and you'd potentially win some of that money that was collected from the infringement notices that day called speed camera lottery. And it changed beh people's behavior within that area. Now this is exciting, it's really tempting. And yet still, I'm a little bit concerned because the extrapolations of people's thinking of this is like, oh, okay, wow, cool. So if we set up this type of reward mechanism and it reduces people's behavior here, why don't we do this other places? And where, where would we need people to slow down the most? Well, schools, of course, you know, because there's kids around, we don't want to hit kids. So why don't we actually incentivize people to slow down uh, during school, in school areas? which completely clashes with the intrinsic motivation of not killing children, right? Um, why would we want to distract and contaminate that inherent motivation with this type of game layer? And so things get fuzzy really, really quickly. And a, one, a great way to destroy the intrinsic motivation, the trust, the autonomy, the collaboration, the connection, the authenticity, the communication, the empathy of your team is to, uh, to impose an extrinsic uh, reward on them. Like just imagine a school environment where people are, the teachers are really collaborative, creative with each other, they take wonderful classes, the kids love going there. Uh, and then some, you know, that they share resources with the school and each other, then some young whippersnapper principal says, I like what I'm seeing here. I tell you what, I'll give you each, uh, the top 10% of you, at top 10%, I'm gonna give you a $10,000 bonus. Now, some teachers might think, oh, I might keep this bit to myself then because I'm not sure if I'm going to be in the top 10% or, um, or I might not be so creative for this because I don't know if this is what the principal is looking for. And so the intention was to enhance collaboration and creativity. The result of the motivational intervention was enhancing competition and conformity. We need to be very, very careful with these elements. And ultimately, as I wrap up this piece and open things up for some communications, uh, communications, questions. Uh, I think the thing that we need to focus on is the importance of play testing. And this is something that you can do in your life. Everything is a game. You'll see that life is an infinite game that consists of many different games. And we are constantly play testing. This means that we need to approach life with curiosity. It means, in my world, having a ritual that allows me to enter a state of metacognition. Um, you can do this right now. Right now, think about what you're thinking about. Okay, whatever you thought about, just think about that, stay with me in the moment. Now, I'd like you to imagine you can see yourself thinking about what you're thinking about. Okay, so you're entering a state of essentially doubly dissociated metacognition. So you can see yourself surrounded by people thinking about what you're thinking about. Now imagine that the real you is currently at home playing the current you as part of a massively multiplayer real world role playing game. Okay, and relax now. Look at all the other beautiful avatars in the room. We're all completely in control here. And yet, unlike many of the games that we play, video games or sports games, we don't actually have that rich visible sense of progress for the things that matter. And so sometimes we play this game of life with this really fuzzy, really loose, unclear sense of what games we're actually playing. One of the things I've been trying to do and, and have relatively effectively integrated was a ritual around gratitudes. It's something that I, Really, you really actually need if you want to keep making progress and dealing with constructive discontent every day. And the initial ritual around this, the game that we're playing is, at the end of the day, think about your gratitudes. And we have this little gratitudes book by our bed and we'd think on our gratitudes, write it down, and there's a lot of science that says this is really good for you. Except what would happen is I would be so tired by the end of the day, Kim would be all happy doing her things, and I'd be so tired that I'd be, oh, here's fucking gratitude things, and you're writing down things, whatever. Um, and then I 
reflected back, I have this thing every Friday, I kind of reflect back waves of friction in the wake, and I realize this isn't working for me. But with this playtest mindset, this curiosity, you can actually tweak the game so that things work better. It's now the first thing I do when I open up my laptop. I do it digitally. Uh, it's changed my relationship with how I start my day, and it's something that I recommend you have a tweak and a playtest for. Where can you find the games that will make a difference in your world? So hopefully that gives us a bit of a sense about this thing. Play is not simply about adding points to things. It's not simply about making things fun and doing a forced smile approach, but rather approaching these things with curiosity, approaching it with a sense of design. What are the goals, rules, and feedback to this experience? How can we tweak these with empathy for the player and provide them with a rich and meaningful sense of progress? Do that and you'll be well on the pathway to evoking more play and more fun in the work that we do. I have a newsletter, uh, drjasonfox.com forward slash PEW. That's the sound a laser makes when you shoot it. Pew! Um, <laughs> which thousands of folks have subscribed to. And we have a bunch of copies of my best-selling book, The Game Changer, um, which has recently been translated into Chinese uh, for you. Tell all your friends in China. And uh, I might just do a quick handover to Dan, and to then we'll me. do some Q&A. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, is, is that chair for, the, for me? Is that for the war? Yeah, it was for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. All right. Of course. Hey, yeah. thanks, Jason. I feel so much smarter than 20 minutes ago. Great. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So the question is, uh, when Jason is dealing with these big corporates who really just want him to endorse putting some fun sprinkles on the top, uh, how does he actually convince them that they need to start, really? The ground yeah, floor. Yeah, great question. And there's this dance that we need to play. I do a similar thing when it comes to innovation. Um, I never use the I word innovation. Um, I instead try to use like a science-based approach. Let's conduct more experiments. Let's, let's use its curiosity drive here. Let's, let's actually, what are our meaningful hypotheses that we want to test here so that we can learn? I kind of dance around that. So if you have a sense that they're looking for fun, they have this fixed notion in their head, I kind of agree with them. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And then I do some yes ands. And then I try to do the yes ands more powerful than the initial idea in a way that makes them think it's their idea. Um, and so what this looks like is trying to encourage a scenario in which, um, in which people are inherently motivated. So yeah, this, this idea of running a competition and having this prize and stuff is really, really cool. It might probably spark some really interest, but I think what we, where we need to go, and this might springboard us into how can we actually sustain this? How can we have this set up where people will carry on with this type of behavior, whatever you want, without there even being a prize there? And in fact, maybe there's an opportunity where we don't even need the prize there in the first place. Or instead of making it a tangible, extrinsic, cash-based prize, we can do something a little bit more playful, like have a special status or have a cup, you know, a special cup or a trophy within the organization that's much more of a, a narrative that's built into the company as opposed to, uh, you know, here's, here's some tickets to gold class or, you know, here's off. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So you, you, that's, that's kind of how I approach it. There are plenty of avenues. Um, if, you, if people are really keen to reward, and rewards make sense, because a lot of us grew up through rewards, a lot of the people that we work for, um, corporate cultures are very reward focused. So it's kind of a love language that they're familiar with. But if we can move away from just the basics of an incentive uh, in a cash form and start to look at those other things that might be um, uh, tangential to it, I think that we might open up more richness. Thank you. Good day. Whoa, look at this. Take one over here. You Great want me question. to respin that? Okay. Uh, do you want me to do a quick... So you, you're oh, doing yeah. a thing in your life... Jump in if I get this wrong. So you're doing a thing in your life that you realize is a habit, but you're not really happy about the fact that you're doing it and you've realized like, maybe there's some cues that are causing you to do that. And if you've got a little bit of knowledge because you've just <coughs> been in here, how would you go about maybe rewiring that? Is that... Yep. Cool. cool. And sorry to the folks that need to go. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry. You know, I don't know if I spoke over time, but here we are. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so I, I approach it with curiosity. So there was a time where I really wanted to run. I really wanted to be the type of person that ran. And, um, but there's lots of things that get in the way, like you know, my alarm would go off and then mornings wouldn't, I wouldn't run because I realized uh, you know, I had to look for the stuff and my running shorts weren't clean and so that was just enough of a half hour excuse for me not to run. And so you work on removing the frictions there. Then you kind of run and then I feel like, wow, I kind of got nothing to show for it. Um, it was, you know, that was kind of cool. So then I started playing with RunKeeper as, a, as an app that gives you a visible sense of progress of how far, how frequent um, that you run. Uh, and then after a while, that was no longer as strong a motivator. And then I discovered free running, like which is where you just essentially run without any tech or any goal or any plans. And that, that was kind of what I needed more from a meditation benefit uh, because of it. 
Briefly in between there I played with Zombies Run, which is a, like an app that makes you feel like you're getting chased by zombies. Um, and that was, that was incredible. Uh, made me run across roads without looking because I was like running from these fake zombies in my head. Um, and there's other things like right now I'm using an app called Streaks, which is where you think of six things that you want to do consistently each day. You set them up and, um, and then every day you, you know, check things off. So part of that is my daily gratitudes journaling. It's um, chatting with a friend. I can go through phases where I can just get so caught up in my work that I'm not actually speaking to other people. So I actually need to jot that down. It's something for me to consciously do to call up a friend. Um, and eat one obviously healthy meal is something at the moment that, you know, it's very easy for me to you know, that's kind of healthy, it's got parsley or something. Um, and, but I'm constantly playtesting, it might be something that I drop. That's kind of the approach. Um, it, but it works while having moments of reflection and curiosity. You kind of got to be allowing yourself to get a little bit meta. You've got to view your life. If, if your life was an autobiography right now, what were the last 12 chapters like? You know, what's the theme that's going on? What's the pattern that's happening? Which is what you identify, there's a pattern, right? And then we can think from that perspective, what do we want the next 12 chapters to be like? And then what are some of the structures or scaffolding or triggers or things that we can have in place that may make that work better? That's kind of how I do it. It's pretty yeah. easy, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, here's what I'm going to do. You're going to hang till 10, right? Because maybe what yeah. I'll do, let me just take one more question from the floor. Sure. Uh, Jay's going to hang around so you can come up and, and chat with him. And uh, yeah, is yeah. that cool? Sounds cool. good. Oh, that's a very straight hand. Let's <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right up there. What's your favorite board game? Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Ooh, good question. I have this stack in our house. Um, I'm addicted to Kickstarter board game projects at the moment. So I've constantly just got random board games coming in. I've got a, the official answer is Settlers of Catan is the gateway drug. So when you're introducing folks that haven't played board games before, you just get them on Settlers of Catan. Hopefully, you know, rig the, jig the board so they're on good settlement areas. So they're, getting, they're having good times. Um, uh, Cards Against Humanity is always good for um, uh, either, you know, there's this saying that if you break a bone, uh, it actually grows back stronger. Um, but I reckon sometimes they're just are broken and they're, you know, so that's what happens with some friends after you play Cards Against Humanity. Um, <laughs> sometimes stronger bonds, sometimes, yeah, you can't make eye contact with each other afterwards. Um, yeah, yeah, that's probably, that's probably a couple of good answers for now. I've got much more obscure things going on, but uh, yeah. Ping me on Twitter and I'll, I'll have a, I think, yeah. Awesome. Good All question. Right, cool. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate you coming out this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.